Hello and welcome. China's growth over the last two decades has been remarkable. In 1995, its economy was half that of the UK. Today, it's six times the size. For the most part, relations with the West have been calm, if not exactly friendly. But from trade wars with the United States to saber rattling in the South China Sea and an arms race in space, there are increasing tensions, not to mention the new laws on Hong Kong. With the emergence of COVID-19 originally in China now causing devastation around the globe, the path to a happy relationship with China looks fraught with difficulty. So should we assume the transition to China's economic dominance will be peaceful and benign, or will the transition prove deeply unsettling for the world and threaten its stability? Or should we see China perhaps as a long-term ally or as a potential threat to our way of life? Well, for this afternoon's debate, we have three eminently qualified speakers who are going to deba be debating exactly those questions. First, we have Sir Malcolm Rifkin, uh, former Secretary of State for Defence and Foreign Secretary in various Conservative governments. And in fact, as Foreign Secretary, he had the responsibility of the final negotiations with China over the transfer of Hong Kong, which has been very much in the news in the past couple of days as we record this uh, debate. He's both a uh, Queen's Council and member of the Privy Council. Then we have Isabel Hilton, journalist, broadcaster, and someone who has worked for The Guardian, The Sunday Times, uh, BBC Radio 4, amongst a variety of distinguished outlets. She is also the founding editor of Chinadialogue.net, an independent, fully bilingual Chinese-English non-profit organization devoted to building a shared approach on climate change and environmental issues with China. And Last but by no means least, Sir Vince Cable, former leader of the Liberal Democrats, served some two decades in Parliament in the Twickenham constituency and former cabinet member as Secretary of State for Business, Innovation and Skills from 2010 to 2015 during the coalition government. So three very, very well informed and distinguished speakers. And we're going to start by addressing a core question at the heart of debate, today's debate, which is, should we view China as an ally or as a threat? And I'm going to ask each of our speakers today to address that question for no more than three minutes to give us their initial positions. And I'm going to start, Malcolm Rifkind, with you. Malcolm. Okay. Thank you very, very much indeed. Now, the question of China, ally or a threat, is obviously in the context that China is now uh, one of the world's superpowers. First point I want to make is China should have been one of the world's superpowers 40 years ago. Uh, if it hadn't been for the lunacy of Mao Zedong, Cultural Revolution, Great Leap Forward, and all these Marxist-Leninist policies, China would have been way back in the 1960s or 70s. How do we know that? It's not just my theory. Look at other Chinese communities, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, all of whom were able to apply market economics and, uh, as a result, had a huge level of prosperity, which China has caught up with. The reason why China is so noticeable is not because it's found some magic formula, but because it has 1.3 billion people in a country of that size, which is economically successful. Of course, that has a powerful impact on the world. Now, is it an ally or a threat? Well, in the famous old saying, it takes two to tango. We did believe until not too long ago that China might gradually, as it emerged as a superpower, uh, be a responsible superpower, one that would try to work constructively, not just with the United States, not just with the West, but with its own neighbors in the Far East as well, in, in Asia. And under Deng Xiaoping, that was largely what was happening as it, that process began. Uh, but it ceased to happen, sadly, when Xi Jinping, the present leader, took power. Because I'm not going to comment on the internal politics of China. What I am going to say is that what has been so disturbing and so sad is it's not just the row with America or the disagreements that they have with Britain or France or Germany or the Euro European Union. He's, uh, he's pursued a policy which has put China in conflict with its own immediate neighbors. Taiwan, obviously, threatening to invade under certain circumstances, but quite apart from Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, virtually every neighbor it has, right through to India, have become deeply alarmed. It's ironic that Vietnam, <laughs> once a sworn enemy of the United States, and now sees America more as an ally than as an enemy, and China is the threat it perceives. Recently, India and Japan had a joint naval exercise, first time in their history. What on earth do India and Japan have in common 
except that they both have China as a neighbor and they feel the need to draw together. So we used to talk about the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. Now it's called the Indo-Pacific. It's a single region which has come into geopolitical language uh, because of the concern about China. Let me make the final point in these introductory uh, comments. And that is simply, uh, I hope we, China will change course. Uh, to last week's events on Hong Kong, deeply disturbing. We might discuss these uh, later on. But if China continues its current course of confrontation with its own neighbors as well as the West, then we will need a policy of containment. It's what we had with the Soviet Union in the bad old days during the Cold War. I don't think we'll have a Cold War, but I think we will have containment unless China behaves in a more responsible fashion. Malcolm Rifkin, thank you very much for a very clearly put first position there. And can I now turn Isabel Hilton to you? Isabel. Thank you, um, Rana. Well, ally or threat, it's one of those binaries. I think I prefer the uh, European Council's formulation that China is both a strategic rival and an economic partner. Um, It's difficult to say never uh, to anything in this world. And I did have to remind myself that the Soviet Union was an ally during World War II. As I was thinking, it's hard to imagine China ever being a strategic uh, or a military ally. So one should never say never, but it is very, very uh, hard to imagine. Um, But that is not to say that we can't make alliances or, or indeed cooperate on certain issues with China. And the critical one is obviously climate change, where China's by far and away the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. And if we believe that uh, climate change is an existential threat, then we have to cooperate with China. Um, That could take many forms. Um, But if we don't, then, you know, all the other questions we're discussing here uh, will be irrelevant. Um, So the degree to which China is a threat, um, in some ways, I think. But again, I prefer the formulation that China is threatening some important things rather than that China is in itself one uh, big comprehensive threat for um, a a number of reasons. But first, what China is threatening, I I agree with Malcolm, uh, you know, very uh, disturbing things on the South China Sea, very bad atmosphere in the neighborhood, very, very concerning about Hong Kong, cyber warfare, those things that we're familiar with. But I would also like to point to the fact that among China's ambitions is the ambition to become a normative power. And this is visible in everything from its external propaganda, its conduct in academia, its efforts to change the language and values of the United Nations, and generally, you know, to challenge the liberal order. And indeed, on the material side, to set standards for advanced technologies, which would certainly give China um, a lot of power. And if China were to succeed in becoming that kind of normative power, then we're looking at a world that is run according to Chinese rules. And I think that is threatening. It's threatening to fundamental values. Um, and and it's threatening, obviously, to you know Western dominance in certain areas of technology. But if you like, that's fair enough. Um, but I don't think that allows one to define China, you know, simply as a threat. Um, one reason is that I think China is facing a lot of internal problems and that China's capacity to fulfill these ambitions is going to be increasingly compromised, particularly after after the pandemic. So again, it's a fairly familiar list, big domestic problems, um, unemployment, debt, aging population, slowing growth, uh, political legitimacy, all of these are really going to keep, I think, Beijing desperately steering the ship and trying to avoid the immediate rocks rather than being able to fulfill any sort of great dreams of global um, domination. If there is a threat in this situation, I think that what we've learned recently is that we have allowed ourselves to become dependent in ways that are undermining our own security and that that needs correcting. That's not quite the same as seeing China as a threat. Isabel, thank you very much. Again, a very clearly put position there. And may I now call on Vince Cable to uh, make your uh, answer to the question of China ally or threat. Vince. Well, my position isn't too different from Isabel's. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a threat to the UK. Uh, it may be a threat to its neighbours, I don't know, but it's certainly not a threat to the UK militarily uh, or in any obvious security sense. 
Uh, we have a lot of common interests in the economics field. We, I was part of a government which developed the so-called golden era. Now, that was before President Xi was uh, so powerful. Um, but we also have much better commonality of interests in areas like the future of the World Trade Organization or climate change than we do with the United States, which is supposed to be one of our allies. So, you know, we, we shouldn't be consumed with negativity. And I, and I do worry that we have got this uh, almost paranoia that has developed about China, which has been manifest in areas like uh, Huawei. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.